Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They're recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 300 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last side of the presentation today. A special thanks Excuse me about that. A uh, special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. And now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 20,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. And now to introduce our speaker, Jim Bender. Welcome, Jim. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Colton. It's uh, my pleasure to be here again to talk about uh, proposals today. Um, this is obviously a big time of year for federal proposals. Uh, I don't know what fraction of the budget for your government agency goes out between July 1 and September 30, but it's a, but it's a huge chunk of money for a lot of reasons. And we all want to use the time and resources we have for responding to proposals carefully so that we win as many of them as possible. Um, so the question is how? And the answer is on the next slide. Here they are, the five secrets to winning more proposals. If this is all you need, you can log off now and I can give you back another 15 minutes. A database bid decision, a detailed and directive outline, a planned out and detailed kickoff meeting, a helpful proposal manager, and well-organized color team reviews. These um, steps are based on uh, years of experience. I've done federal contracting of over 20 years, speaking with colleagues who are bids and proposals and capture experts. Uh, there are just certain things about writing win winning proposals that cuts across all industries and all agencies. So let's dive right into the first step, a database decision. Um, the critical thing about writing a good proposal is not having snappy language or hot uh, illustrations, although those are important. Uh, but you got the, the to the the victory goes to those who are well prepared, those who knew about this opportunity before it came out and spent time figuring out the playing field. Now I know you're going to say, well, sometimes these things just drop out of the air, and I need to decide whether to bid. And certainly there are times where you're going to bid on something without the answers to all these questions. But the more of these questions that you can answer with objective evidence, not with hunches or guesses or rumors on the street, but objective evidence, the more likely you're going to win. The first bullet is probably the most important. I work as a business development consultant with all kinds of small businesses and medium-sized businesses and all kinds of agencies. And they say, Jim, can you help me with this proposal? And I say, First question I always ask is, what does the customer know about you? Have you ever met them? And if the answer is no, I cringe. If the first time the uh, customers ever heard of your company is when they open up your proposal, you're already behind. Even if they've just seen you on LinkedIn or they read an email from you, if they know something about your company that it exists and anything about your reputation, you're in a better place. Um, and hopefully uh, you've not only been able to get your capability statement to them, but maybe a visit from them. But I know it's very hard to get feds on the phone. Um, so 
that this is not only the case, but it, it's probably more important than any of these to just have met the client and know something about them. Uh, you know, I can read all of this, uh, the questions on this slide, but I think you can all, all, all read them. I think uh, another thing that's very important here is knowing the competitive environment, especially the status of the incumbent contractor. Do we know who the incumbent contractor is? Sometimes it's a new requirement and knowing that is helpful because if it's a new requirement, you don't have to deal with somebody who's already doing the work and already has a reputation. And you can go on um, fpds.gov, which is still the active uh, archive for um, uh, procurement records, or any of the other many databases that derive from fpds.gov, and just put in the NAICS code in the agency and see who else is working there. And see if you can, if you can find uh, a contract that's expiring in the next six months with the same title, well, guess what? That's the incumbent contract. That's gonna tell you how much they're spending now, and usually what they're spending now is uh, similar to what they're gonna spend in the future. You can go back and find the previous RFP and the scope of work there and compare it to the price to see what the pricing competition is. Knowing the competitive environment and stopping to figure out who you're up against and how you stack up against them is really critical. Um, knowing, uh, knowing, uh, the competitive environment and how you compare against the stated evaluation criteria is also uh, critical. And be taking an honest um, look at the competitors and what you know about them, and I hope you know something about them, and coming up with what's the reason that our company is going to beat all of these other ones that are there. Uh, and the last bullet I also want to point out, because people forget this, you get so wrapped up with a great solution and great staff and great writing. But if uh, you have uh, waited until two weeks are gone out of a four-week RFP window, you're already way behind because there is nothing you can do to make up time and your competitor started on day one, and if you're starting on day 14 out of 28, um, you, are all, you are already putting yourself at a disadvantage. So time is also uh, a critical factor in making a decision. Uh, next slide, please. So the second thing we're gonna talk about here is your out your your uh, outline your outline for the proposal so if you're doing your job uh, in the best way possible you know uh some of the answers to the questions on the previous slide you've been doing your research you've been doing your visiting with your client you've talked to other people who work in the same space and you know a lot about what's going on and what it's going to take to win the next critical thing is getting that down on paper to share it with the proposal team. And if your proposal team is you, then just getting it down on paper and organizing it is critical. Um, you got to know what it's going to take to win. Why are you going to win? What sets you apart from the other people who you know are bidding on this and are maybe bidding on it? And have those themes uh, condensed into three to five statements that you're gonna put um, at, the, at the introduction to your proposal and then refer back to them and treat those as themes for the story you're gonna tell about why the client should choose you. So in your outline, you're gonna have the win themes up top. You're obviously gonna split up the page allocations between the sections. And then um, the most helpful thing you're gonna do for your writers is you're going to take section C, L, and M of the RFP, that is the project work statement or the scope of work, which is section C, the instructions to offers, which is section L, and the evaluation criteria, which is section M, and you're going to line them all up. And you put them all in one place so they don't have to flip back and forth in the RFP between those three sections and figure out how to line them up. You want the writers to just do the writing, not the figuring out and not the administrative stuff. Um, and you should be willing to take the time 
take a couple of days um, to put this outline together so that you save all this time for your writers. Um, and then I could read the rest, rest of all of this, but you can see the other things you need to include in your outline. You want to go section by section and tell the writers uh, what you need to cover in this section. What are the features, benefits, and proof points that you want to emphasize? Maybe even link it to past performances to prove it. Um, uh, you might even write for them a little lead-in paragraph for it that sort of sets the tone of what you want to cover in, in the section. And uh, you should also be planning out your graphics, your the titles for those graphics, the captions, the charts, the illustrations. Um, because no proposal these days should go in with just words. At, pictures speak a lot more than words, and uh, they get people's attention. And they communicate. Uh, they communicate your critical points well. Um, so uh, you know, I, I can hear people say, "Well, I, I, I don't have much time to write this. I don't have time to do this outline. Let's give people the RFP and let them go." Well, you can do that, but then what you get is a crappy first draft. You get a first draft that's a, that's a hot mess that has big holes in it, that uh, things haven't been covered, you have different voices, uh, and you have overlap, and you are going to go through a lot of pain between the first draft and the second draft to sort it out. A rule of thumb that good proposal managers, experienced proposal managers use, is you should be using 10 to 15 percent of the lead time for your or the response time for your proposal before you start writing. So if you think of a you know a, a four week uh, opening, that's like two or three days, uh, uh, maybe even four days that you're going to sit down and strategize with your team about how you're going to approach the writing assignment, and that time will really save you. That time you spend at the outset will save you time later on with rewrites, and not to mention demotivating people because you said, "Oh man, this first draft just needs a lot of work." I mean, who who uh, among your writers wants to be told they have to do a lot to get the first from the first to the second draft? Um, and they got day jobs. I mean, they're like uh, fifty. That, or 80% billable, that's probably 80 or 90% billable. And they need to do all their delivery work and your proposals on nights and weekends. So uh, be kind to them and use their time well. Next slide, please. Okay, after you spent that uh, 10 to 15% of the opening time on the planning and the outline, you're going to have your kickoff meeting. Uh, the, the kickoff meeting is the official move from the opportunity intel, intel phase or the capture phase, that is the prep work and the planning work, to the proposal phase, to the execution of the proposal document. Both phases are really important, but um, all the information that you have about the opportunity, the agency, and the comp competitive matrix needs to be communicated clearly and usefully to your proposal team in this uh, kickoff meeting. Next slide. Uh, so first of all, who should be present? Uh, basically everybody working on the thing. Um, you know, you should have, if you have a sep you have somebody who was doing the BD work pre-RFP, they should be there. And if it's a different person who's actually managing the proposal, uh, they should also be there. Get your handing from one to the other. All the writers for the entire meeting should be there. Don't let people go in and out because you're going to discuss how you're going to approach the proposal uh, section by section. And if uh, you know you're having a cat conversation about task one here, it may affect how the writer of task four or the staffing section approaches their thing. And if you have a a really well organized and long kickoff meeting to sort out all, all those issues, then you're gonna have less work at the uh, from the pink team to the red team to do uh, the work. So you want all the writers there for the entire meeting. You want, uh, you know, there's gonna be somebody who's handling your 
uh, proposal volumes, and uh, organizing the information. Uh, you're going to want your costing lead because all of the decisions you're making there are going to have uh, cost implications. Um, you're going to want to have a direction for people on how much we expect this to cost so that the tech, the engineers aren't coming up with a Cadillac solution and the cost people have a, a Hyundai or a Yugo uh, a price in mind. Um, you, uh, if you have key subcontractors and they're under their non-disclosure agreement, they ought to be there too because they're going to be doing sections of the proposal that um, tie into all the other ones. Um, and um, that's so, so basically everybody involved in doing the proposal should be there. You're going to have a capture summary, a summary of everything that you learned pre-RFP about the customer, about the, what's most important um, as stated in the RFP and what's most important from what we know about the agency. You're going to talk about our proposed solution and why it's direct, uh, um, different about the competition and how we're going to prove we're better and, um, and then hammer out the win strategy. And of course, that great outline that you spent three days on should not be uh, set in stone because the people in the room are going to have ideas. And that's one of the reasons why you have them all in the room to hear those ideas and uh, adapt your outline uh, on the fly. Next slide, please. Um, here's a, uh, the sort of agenda that you can go through. You're going to go through section by section of the RFP. You're going to establish the team roles, make sure everybody understands what they have to do, go over the schedule. Please have a shared resource space. I can't believe in 2020, I still work with contractors and when they're working on a proposal, they're emailing files back and forth. It's just uh, an invitation to disaster and uh, uh, version control if you're emailing files back and forth and ex um, expecting uh, bad things not to happen. You, you got to have SharePoint or Google Drive or OneDrive or whatever you have where there's all the proposal documents are there so people can find them so that they have the most updated version at hand. No, that's the yesterday's outline. This is today's outline. I'm sorry you just spent half an hour working on the wrong um, working from the wrong outline or you know two different versions of a section that you have to reconcile shared resource space please um and make sure you have those cost targets in mind next slide please <clears throat> okay the number four is um the uh, secret number four is a helpful proposal manager now i've been a proposal manager and i'd say wow we got the star writing team on here all I'm going to need to do is give them the outline, the RFP, and we're going to get great stuff back. Um, and sometimes that happens, but more often you need to uh, do a little more one-to-one. -one. So after the kickoff meeting, uh, make sure you're spending time with your writers. Make sure they have what they need. How many times have you had, um, you know, the executive of the company say, you know, uh, uh, John over here is a really excellent up and coming writer. I, I think you should give him a try on this section. <clears throat> and you give John his assignment and he seems excited about it and he does seem really sharp. And you know, you get down to four hours before the deadline for the pink team review and he says he needs two more hours to do it, two more hours pass. The next morning comes and it's you know three o'clock in the morning, he sends you the draft and it's a hot mess. And it's easy to blame John for that, but uh, the, the blame also might be with the proposal manager who put him in over his head and didn't check in with him. So you check in with them, especially somebody you don't know well, and make sure, you know, any questions about the outline, anything I can do, how are you doing with this? Uh, and don't wait until the last minute to find out that they uh, misunderstood the direction or uh, they're not able to do their job. Uh, next slide, please. 
then uh, the, the last uh, tip I'm going to share is uh, you ought to have well-organized color team reviews. Again, uh, we have a tendency in the proposal world to just say, okay, here's the draft, here's the RFP, we'll talk at three, rather than giving people specific direction about what you want them to review. Uh, uh, tell them what is expected out of their review and what is not. Most of the time, you don't want them to correct proofreading and you don't want them to uh, reformat the thing. The, you've got uh, an editor who's going to do that at the last minute for them. Um, ideally, you want to give them a form to fill out section by section uh, and tell them uh, what know what you want them to do in each section. You want them to read it against the requirements and your outline and your compliance matrix and see if it's uh, compliant. Uh, and you know, I, I have this system that I use with red, yellow, green, and blue. A lot of other people use this. Uh, red is unacceptable, yellow is marginal, green is compliant and blue is as exceeds requirements. And of course you wanna get as much blue as possible. Um, you, uh, um, you obviously, you wanna give them enough time to do their review. So you gotta ride hard on the writing team to do their job and meet their deadline. And usually I'd like to give the reviewers a minimum of 24 hours in advance. Um, and then when you run the actual color team review, um, you uh, want to assign somebody to carefully write down what was decided and not have the writers write it down, but have a facilitator and a recorder that writes down all of the feedback that you hear. And then you're gonna have a, dis a decision-making meeting with the whole team or with the executive team to decide what you're gonna do with it. And then that matrix is gonna go back to the uh, proposal team with instruction, that, okay, task three, you've got these five things you need to do. And then the writer will come back and uh, tell you when he's, he or she has got that done. Um, so uh, you want an organized team with uh, clear instructions about what the, uh, about what the reviewer is gonna do, a form for them to fill out and you know, if. All these things I'm talking about, if you want samples, I can email you samples, like the uh, form that we give to reviewers or what a good outline looks like, uh, what a bid board looks like that shows you uh, the competitive matrix. Um, you know, if those are things that would be helpful to you, I'd be glad to send you a sample. Uh, next slide, please. What do we got here? Oh, okay, so that's the end here. So here's my email address and my phone number. I encourage you, um, if you have questions about what I discussed, uh, please shoot me an email. I'll be glad to answer your questions. I have, a, um, my website is zk-development.com and there's a blog post that I put up uh, earlier this week about this that goes into a little more detail on it. And I'll be happy to say, uh, share with you templates that I use in uh, proposal management and answer your question. And with that, Colin, uh, thank you. Uh, Colton, uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to speak today and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jim, uh, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics in federal contracting.